as part of the centennial of the California Courts of Appeal, the Judicial Council and the Administrative Office of the Courts have instituted the Appellate Court Legacy Project, whose purpose is to create an oral history of the Appellate Courts in California. And this afternoon's conversation with retired Associate Justice John G. Gabbard is one of the first of the recorded interviews of this project. My name is Betty Richley, and I am an Associate Justice in Division Two of the Fourth District Court of Appeals sitting in Riverside, California. And it is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to Justice John Gabbard. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon to you. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Gabbard, those of us in the legal community think of you as a Renaissance man. You've been a ham radio operator, <laughs> a beer brewer, and a, a bread maker, part owner of a backpacking supply store, a motorcycle rider, traveler, and author. And in addition to this list of diverse accomplishments, you have also had a very remarkable legal career. You became an attorney in 1934, a Superior Court judge in 1949, and an Appellate Court Justice in 1970. And it is this career spanning most of the 20th century on which we would like to concentrate this afternoon. So I'm going to start the inquiry, Justice Gabbard. Okay. You were born in California in 1909 and you came to live here in Riverside when you were three years old in 1912 and right. you've remained here all of your life. Where did you attend college and where did you go to law school? Well, I, I went two years to uh, Riverside Junior College and uh, uh, graduated there in 1929 and then went to Occidental College in Los Angeles for my junior and senior years. Uh, then I went to uh, one year at uh, Duke University and then uh, finished the law at uh, uh, Bolt Hall, Berkeley and graduated in the class of 30, 1934. My understanding is you had a scholarship to Duke and that you finished at Bolt because I believe your father wanted you to attend Berkeley. Is that correct? That's right. I, I was, uh, during the time I was in junior college and at Oxy, and uh, for years after, and two years after that, I was working up in uh, uh, Sequoia Park in the summertime because these were rather tough times uh, financially. The uh, Great Depression was felt pretty strongly in this yes. area and by my family and uh, so I was glad to be able to get any kind of a job I could. I got a job as a spieler on a sightseeing bus and permanently ruined my voice as a result. They didn't have microphones and public address systems in those <laughs> days. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, or at least the kind of we could use on the bus, uh, we uh, so in the summer times, I was working up at, uh, at uh, Sequoia. And then after my first year at Duke, which I loved very much and liked very much, um, the attorney for the parks company came up to uh, see uh, the manager and spent a day or two. And uh, he had been my uh, boy scout, uh, uh, scoutmaster when I was a kid. and. Uh, I saw him sitting out on the lodge uh, uh, veranda one evening smoking a cigar and I went up to him. He was Senator Leonard DeFani from Riverside and uh, I introduced myself to him and he remembered me somewhat I guess and we got talking and he asked me what I was doing and I said well I was going to law school and so he said well uh, uh, where, uh, he asked me where and so forth and I told him at Duke University back in North Carolina. And uh, he said, well, where are you going to practice? And I said, well, I don't know. I hope to practice in Riverside. He said, whoa, you've just got to get away from North Carolina and come back to California. You should go to California, law school in California. And uh, he was a great uh, USC law booster. He said, you've got to go to USC. Well, it caused me to worry a little bit about it. I called my father on the telephone and asked him what he thought. Well, my dad was a great... Uh, old Cal Booster, he'd gone to Berkeley and uh, not law school but uh, to the university and, and it was those were the salad days of his life and and uh, he, he loved Berkeley. 
And he said, well, if you're going to come to California, that, that sounds good to me. He said, I think you should go to Berkeley. So uh, uh, I uh, wrote a letter to the law school at Berkeley and asked what I had to do to be considered, whether I could get in, what, and so forth. And uh, they said, well, send us a copy of your transcript from Duke, and, uh, and then you will also have to come and, and have an interview with the dean. So uh, I got my transcript and uh, sent it up there, and, and uh, so they said to come and see the dean on such and such a day. And, and so that was at the end of the season, and so I went up to Berkeley and went in and see the dean, and the only question he asked me is, do you think you'll like it up here? And I said, I'm sure, sure I will. Well, fine. That's all. <laughs> what, what a difference. What a, think of it. The, the, the <laughs> difference between now and then in, in, in getting into a, into a top grade law school or any law school <laughs> compared with those days. It was just incredible. Well, and I finished my last two years at Berkeley. Well, obviously. Where were you from? Just kidding. Good afternoon. As part of the centennial of the California Courts of Appeal, the Judicial Council and the Administrative Office of the Courts have instituted the Appellate Court Legacy Project, whose purpose is to create an oral history of the appellate courts in California, and this afternoon's conversation with retired Associate Justice John G. Gabbard is one of the first of the recorded interviews of this project. My name is Betty Richley, and I am an Associate Justice in Division II of the Fourth District Court of Appeal, sitting here in Riverside, California. It is my pleasure to introduce to you this afternoon Justice John Gabbard. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, Justice Gabbard, you were born in California in 1909. And you came to live in Riverside when you were three years old. I believe that was in 1912. And you've remained here in this community ever since. Where did you attend college and where did you go to law school? Well, I attended uh, college at, uh, started out here in Riverside, at Riverside Junior College then. Incidentally, in those days, it was a school of about uh, uh, 260 students. Today it has 34,000 students. <laughs> I graduated there in 1929. Then I went to two years to Occidental College. And then to uh, uh, first year of law school, I went to Duke University. And then uh, finished my second and third years at Bolt Hall, Berkeley. Now you, I understand, had a scholarship to Duke Law School and were persuaded by your dad to attend Bolt. And what's the story behind that? Well, uh, I, I did have a scholarship. Uh, when I was at Oxy, I was a janitor in uh, one of the uh, halls. And uh, I would work there in the uh, early evening. And I noticed that there was a sign on the, on the uh, bulletin board that there were uh, law scholarships available at Duke University. And they had a little thing so that you could make an application. So I thought, well, I'd like to go to law school. I'll try that. So I hadn't made any final plans then. And so I did and uh, got back uh, to send them a um, resume and um, a scholastic record and so on, which I did. And then I got a notice that I could go. They give me a scholarship. I got a scholarship for uh, the tuition, and uh, it, all it cost me for my room and board and everything uh, was forty dollars a month, <laughs> and so I I got my uh, uh, life there for very little, and and it was a lifesaver in those days uh, of pretty tough economic times, and uh, I went there and I liked it and I got my scholarship rewarded uh, for a second year, but then I was working uh, during the summers. I uh, worked for several summers as the uh, spieler on a sightseeing bus in uh, in Sequoia Park. That's where I permanently ruined my voice trying to speak up over the grinding gears of that bus. <laughs> anyway, uh, I uh, one evening, uh, the attorney who represented the parks company was up seeing the manager for a few days on uh, matters of the company. and. He was Senator Leonard Defani from Riverside, and uh, he had been my scoutmaster when I was a, a, a young scout. 
And uh, so I went up and uh, he was sitting out on the veranda and I went up to him and introduced myself and, and he remembered me, I guess. And uh, so he asked me what I was doing and one thing or another and learned I was going to Duke Law School. And he said, well, where do you expect to practice? And, or where do you want to practice? And I said, well, I hope to go to back to Riverside. He said, well, you're, you should come to a California school and finish up out here, he said. I said, you should come here and a lot of things you ought to know about California that you won't get back there and so on, so on, so on. Well, I then got in touch with my dad because I valued his opinion and whether I should uh, try to leave Duke and come out here. And, and my dad came up to see me, drove up uh, to Sequoia and uh, took a couple of days to do it up and back. And uh, I told him what uh, Leonard Defani told me and he said, well, he said, I think that sounds pretty good to me. He said, but you should go to Cal. Uh, Leonard wanted me to go to USC, where he was, he was a USC law grad. My dad was an old Cal booster. Well, so finally I made the application at Berkeley and all I had to do was submit a, a transcript and a, and to go and have a, a, a interview with the dean, Dean McMurray. And so I made an appointment and went up just before school was to start, went in to see him and I figured that Duke didn't start as early as Cal did. And if I got turned out, I could go back to Duke. <laughs> and he said, well, do you think you'd like it up here? And I said, yeah, I sure would. So fine. And that was, <laughs> that all, was it. all it was in those days. <laughs> Incredible. That is pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you should say, well, well, obviously, Justice Gabbard, all they needed was a short interview. <laughs> they were right. Well, <laughs> they accepted Well, I you. think everybody had a short interview <laughs> in those days. <laughs> what made you decide to enter the legal profession? Well, I think it was just a sheer chance. Uh, when I was in high school, when I was a freshman in high school, I got dragooned into participating in... Uh, interclass debate. That was due to my father. I had a good friend who, uh, as a joke, as each class at the high school here had to elect officers, and the freshmen uh, uh, had their meeting. They didn't know what, what they had to do or anything, but some, some member of the faculty told us that they, we needed to have a president, and a vice president, and a secretary, and, and a treasurer, and have a debate manager. What do you need a debate manager? Well, every class has to debate every other class in a public assembly and then the winner uh, is the champion. Well, so just as a joke, they elected this friend of mine. <laughs> and uh, So one Friday night, I was went to the movies with some other friends of mine and this fellow, Perry Ellis was his name, came to my house and my dad was there and knew him, and and uh, he, he wanted to know if I was home, and my dad said, no, I think he went to the movies. And uh, he said, uh, what are you here for, Perry? Well, he said, I'm trying to find some guy who will be, serve on the debate team. He said, I can't find any. We've got to debate the sophomores uh, in, the, in the assembly. And uh, so uh, my dad said, well, I'll have John do it with you. And Ellis couldn't find anyone else, so the two of us, were debate, the debate team. Oh boy, was I put up a big howl when my dad told me I had to do that. He said, listen, I've never asked you to do something that I didn't want you to do very seriously. I never made you do anything, but I'm making you do this. Well, it was the best thing that ever happened. Perry and I didn't even know what a debate was. So <laughs> my dad <laughs> became our coach and he he was a newspaper man, the editor of the local newspaper, the Enterprise. And so the subject was resolved that there should be a, a secretary of education in the president's cabinet. He belonged to uh, uh, newspaper associations and, and they had a, a, a service called the editorial research reports. So he called them to get the material. So he got the material on that subject. Then he made us go over that. Then he made us 
said, you've got to write your speeches out and I'm going to have you memorize them. <laughs> I think there were eight minute speeches or so. Eight minutes and four or five minutes each for rebuttal. Well, anyway, make a long story short, he practically had to do everything to get us into the thing. He took us down one weekend to the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego and had us walking up and down the beach until we knew our speech is absolutely perfect. We, we were just little parrots, but we just swamped the sophomores. <laughs> and uh, so I was so scared to death that my socks might fall down that I wore in those days, people wore garters. <laughs> I wore two pairs of garters. I mean, that's so, but, and I was just petrified and so was my partner, but we, we had, he, my dad had ingrained this into us. Okay, and in getting ready for it, he said, now you gotta prepare for the rebuttal. Well, what's rebuttal? We didn't even know what that was. He said, well, you've gotta answer the, uh, the arguments that the other side makes. So he said, what are the arguments that the other side makes? Well, he made us list the things we'd gotten out of the editorial research reports. So we had eight or 10 points. So he divided them up and we wrote a short 30-second uh, rebuttal for each one of them. And then we divided them between us and, uh, and we each had to memorize all of those. So this gave you a great well, background, didn't it? <laughs> we beat the heck out of them. Well, that was the only thing the freshmen did that whole year, I guess, the Monday thing. And all the teachers would go into the class, they'd congratulate us, you know, for this. And it built your ego up. And I thought that was great. Well, we went on. Well, we, and we had to debate the juniors who had beaten the seniors. And uh, so we went to my dad and said, hey, we got this, we got to debate a question about branch banking. Will you help us? He said, no, I showed you what you had to do, you do it. Which was another good thing he did for us. So Perry and I had an idea and we stumbled along and we won that one. So th that was the big deal and it got us all enthused and, and, and excited. So we got on the, the high school debate team as freshmen and uh, we debated and so th from then on the only thing I ever wanted to do in high school and college was debate, debate. and that's, that got me started. Well and then the law part came, uh, my father uh, with the newspaper uh, was sued for liable uh, and uh, it was a big case. He was sued by a member of the Klan, was he not? Yeah, by the Ku Klux Klan, uh, who, who, well, back up. Well, that sued your father was a member of the Klan, was yes, he, he not? Yes, he was also the mayor of Riverside. Yeah, sir, that, that, and, uh, ask that question one more time. Right. The, the, the man who sued your father was a member of the Klan, was he not? Yes, and he was uh, also the mayor of Riverside. Now, to back up a little bit, Riverside had a large population of Chinese and the old uh, animosity and racial attitudes toward the Chinese was very prevalent in this community. Unfortunately, the Chinese were here for, first of all, they were very active in the earliest days in the citrus industry, in the packing and, uh, and the grove management yeah. work. Then they later they were in uh, gardening and they had uh, rather large uh, market gardens and so on. They had a, a section in the downtown area where they lived or, or close in a few blocks and uh, one day uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, racial animosity toward them stirred up and a group from the Klan, we, well, I believe now, went down and burned them out, burned them all out. Well, so they were driven down into the river bottom area where they had another little uh, Chinatown which went on for years. Well, my father took a strong view of that in the paper and that was probably tempered by the fact that my father could speak Chinese. His major, his major in college was English, but his minor was Chinese and he and one other student were the only ones taking Chinese when he was at the University of California for four years. They had a wonderful professor who was practically a teacher and my dad could read and write in Mandarin. Not too well, I'm sure. The local Chinese were all uh, from Canton.
but there was enough spillover so okay. he could palaver with them. They thought he was God, and he would he took their side in fighting the, this this uh, uh, animosity that they and the uh, actions were taken against them. I might say that my sister and I never had such pres presents as the Chinese brought to us every Christmas. Oh. We had more lychee nuts, she had more <laughs> porcelain dolls, I had more uh, uh, little uh, uh, the abacus and bo the, boxes, yeah. you know, with uh, secret ways of opening them and closing them and so forth. Well, anyway, uh, so that was what happened. Well, but this was a big thing, and uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, local judges excused themselves or recused themselves, and uh, called out uh, for help, and uh, Leon Yankwich, judge from Los Angeles, who was quite a specialist apparently in uh, libel and slander and so forth, came out, and they, even the big courtroom in the courthouse was too small to take care of the crowds, and so they hired the Elks Club to take care of the crowds for this trial, and the trial lasted 20 minutes. Uh, my father's uh, attorney uh, had a legal point there, which he argued to Judge Yankwich, and Judge Yankwich dismissed the case. I don't know what the circumstances were. And so around the dinner table that night, my father, who'd been through the ringer, of course, on this, was uh, ecstatic over it, and my mother said, but Ray, how much did it cost? And my dad said, well, I had to pay him $1,000 for today, and, and then I uh, said, one of us or some, somehow or other came out that the attorney had only appeared for 20 minutes. I thought, my God, $1,000 for 20 minutes, that sounds like a pretty good deal. <laughs> That's from then on, I thought I might go to, into the law. <laughs> 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 oh, that's a great story and <laughs> a wonderful incentive. <laughs> well, and so then I continued, and I also I thought that all a lawyer had to do was talk. Yeah. So that's why I was continued with my debate. <laughs> uh, Justice Gabbert, you graduated from Bolt in 1934, and you took a bar review class, and, and I think it's interesting uh, to note that uh, the teacher of your bar re class, review class was none other than... Bernie Whitkin. And... <laughs> And uh, he, this was the second, third, fourth class he had taught Barbie. It was class? one of the very first, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe the third, uh, second or third or fourth. Anyway, Boy. he he didn't even have his uh, uh, summary of California law, uh, as we later know it as a book, bound book. It was a uh, uh, free sheets of immunograph paper, <laughs> and uh, but uh, and it was held in San Francisco. And, uh, and I would say there are probably 25 were in the class. And you passed the bar and became a member so, member of the Riverside Legal Community yeah. in 1934. Thanks to Bernie. Thanks to Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you joined the Riverside County Bar Association, about how many members were there? Well, I, I think that uh, there were probably, there were under 50. And that included the four new members who joined that year. There hadn't been any young lawyers come here for several years. Uh, I think uh, the last had come up maybe five years before uh, uh, Russ Waite, uh, Harmon Brown maybe a year or two ahead of Russ. And then, uh, but there were four of us. Uh, Mary McFarland uh, was from Bolt, my class there. Uh, then there was Don Adams and Christian Soro, uh, who had graduated the same year over at Hastings. Now, Mary's father was uh, one of the earliest mayors, maybe the first mayor of Riverside. He was one of the old, old-time uh, attorneys and, and well-known and respected. Had a major, he probably had the major uh, probate business in, in the county. And then uh, Chris Soro's father was a partner in uh, the then leading uh, major uh, uh, civil... Uh, a commercial uh, trial firm, uh, Soro and Thompson, and so Chris went with his dad. And that became Thompson and Colgate. It later some became point Thompson in time. and Colgate, yes. Then uh, uh, Don Adams, uh, I knew Don, although he was uh, several years older than I was, uh, but I, because his father uh, was uh, the leading, uh, probably a leading doctor in Riverside at the time, 
and he was our family doctor, and we knew them and knew the family and had been there many times and visited with them, and they, they do us. And he and I both uh, were faced with the problem of finding a, some place to go. Uh, this was the bottom of the Depression, and even fellows who were the top-notch boys in our uh, class uh, couldn't find things to do. One, one member of the class got a job with Pillsbury, Madison, and Sutro in San Francisco at the enormous salary then of $125 a month. And every one of us thought, my God, that's the millennium has been reached, you know. And many of the fellows couldn't find anything to do. Eventually, all of them found places, you know. But uh, it took time, and, and they worked maybe two or three years sometimes in other things before they could get into the practice. Yeah. So Don and I finally came to the conclusion. Uh, actually, I didn't go out and, and walk the streets, but I made inquiries here and there. And it, there was just no openings that I could discern. And so Don and I thought, well, why don't we hang out a shingle and see what'll happen? And not much did. <laughs> <laughs> uh you practiced then in a in private practice until about 1943. That was the height of the Second World War. And then, what happened to you at that time? Well, uh, after Don and I worked together, uh, can I back up on this yes. so, to get into it? Uh, we worked together for a year, and he had financial backing that I didn't have, and. Uh, uh, while we managed to pay our secretary and thirty-five dollars rent for the offices, uh, it was a it was, it was a situation that if I hadn't lived at home, I wouldn't have made it. And so, uh, during that year, I, I tried, I guess, uh, or, or was appointed on, and tried a number of uh, criminal defense cases uh, when I was appointed by the court. Uh, when uh, the uh, uh, criminal charge needed counsel, and they didn't have a public defender, and uh, the uh, this was all pro bono, no pay whatsoever. Uh, the uh, but <laughs> the judges normally would appoint young lawyers to represent the fellows that were needed counsel, but uh, Chauncey and. George uh, Chauncey McFarland and George Soro knew the judges. They said, "We, I can't bear, stand. I need Mary in the office. I need Chris in the office." So, the judges would appoint Don Adams and me on every every criminal calendar when anyone needed an attorney. Well, Don didn't want to do any court work. He was a, he wanted to do all, all uh, office work, and he de eventually developed into a very very uh, good probate attorney, and and that was what he wanted to do. So I would take all his cases. I figured that that was where I could get some experiences. It was a real catch can, <laughs> catch as catch can experience and a wonderful experience for me. I don't know how, what I did for my clients, but I sure tried. Yeah. Well, I, I really made the DA work in a few cases. And so he offered me a job as a deputy and that was my lifesaver. And then I, I, was, I was there for three years and then went to with the uh, best and best, and eventually became a partner in that firm. And and it was that was in 1938. So you were with uh, best and best, which subsequently became. So Justice Fisher, you didn't yeah. ask the question about the best. Yeah. The the firm that you refer to as best and best actually then became known as. Best Best and Krieger, but at that time, after you joined it, you became a partner, and it was Best Best and Gabbert, wasn't That's it? That's right. And then, uh, and I had known Jim Krieger in uh, high school. I went, took my last two years in high school in South Pasadena, where my family moved for two years, and uh, I knew him there. And uh, he had gone to Columbia Law School. I didn't know him. I after high school, we uh, we separated as far as uh, knowing each other was uh, being acquainted, and. Uh, he uh, uh, then came out back to California and was with you know, Melvin and Meyer's office in Los Angeles and doing well there. But he wanted to come to a smaller town. He married a young lady from Riverside. Well, one day I was down at the Justice Court filing some papers or something, and her mother 
uh, was the uh, acting as the clerk of the justice court. And it was in summertime, and uh, Lois, her daughter, was helping her down there doing some work. And, and uh, so she spoke to me and asked me if, if, they, if I knew any place where uh, her husband Jim might be able to find a, a place to go in Riverside. And when I find out, found out that, that he was, it was Jim Krieger, I didn't know that it was the same guy. And I said, well, have him come out and we'll have uh, the firm interview him, which he did. And we then proceeded in that fashion. And the rest, as we know, is history, yeah, so they, to speak. They, they now have 188 lawyers <laughs> in the firm. <laughs> now, it was while you were at Best Best and Gabbard's that you, uh, were you drafted into the Army? Well, essentially, I guess. Uh, I was working on, a, to me, the most important case I ever had involving a lot of water rights in the Moreno Valley. And uh, I'd been working on it for some months. I had drawn the number one number for a father. I had two kids at that time in the draft. So you were in, all oh, fathers will be called, fathers won't be called. Oh my goodness. One day, Time Magazine came out with a big question mark on the cover and it showed us some men and little kids and said, will fathers be next? And the board of directors of the company, knowing that this case was going to eventually within the next few months come probably to trial I asked me well, now what is your what's your draft status about this uh, so I said well I'll go and find out so I knew the clerk of the draft board and uh, I went up to him and spoke to him and asked him I told him the reason I was asking I I wanted to be sure what my sta status was and and the people who were uh, in the uh, the uh, officers of the water company wanted to know. And so he said, well, I'll tell you, John, the truth is you're going to be called in two weeks. <laughs> and I said, all right, Clyde, I'll make a deal with you if I can. If I enlist today, can you postpone my activation uh, for a short time so that I can get to work on this thing and, and get somebody else to take this case, which is the main thing I'm concerned about. And so we made a deal. And uh, then I got my partner, Gene Best, and the two of us then began a real search to find uh, an attorney to take the case mm -hmm. over. And we got uh, uh, Justice, uh, retired Justice John Preston of the California Supreme Court to take the case. And uh, that was a very interesting experience, working with him very intensively for a couple of weeks, really, on that case. and. Uh, then I uh, went down and they shipped me back to uh, Fort Custer, Michigan to go to the military police basic training, and, uh, which I did. And then, then I was sent to the uh, Pro Marshal uh, General's uh, Investigator School and went to that and uh, then went to New Guinea and the Philippines as a special agent for the Pro Marshal. And how long were you in the Philippines? 14 months. Well, I was in, in New, New Guinea and the Philippines 14 months. Uh, I was waiting in, the, in New Guinea for several months before we could get into the Philippines. And were you in the Philippines when MacArthur returned? No, he, was, he returned at, uh, at the time of the yeah. Battle of Leyte, yeah. but we were in there right afterward. Right. And we were in there when they were fighting in Manila yeah. and uh, participated on the edges of that that sort of thing for a while was got shot at a couple of times <laughs> and uh, then I, I got admitted to the uh, the Republic of the Philippines was created you know uh, uh, they had their constitutional convention and everything right across the street from where we were staying in an old house in Manila and we could look in the window while they were debating the constitutional convention of the Republic of the Philippines so uh, their uh, uh, Supreme Court met at the Malacanon Palace, and uh, another fellow and I, and nearly all of us in the uh, on the CID were attorneys. Well, probably seventy-five percent were attorneys. Another fellow and I that worked together all the time. We were both attorneys, and we went down, got admitted to the Philippine Supreme Court, <laughs> and so then. 
uh, we appeared a few times before the Supreme Court on matters which probably could have been taken care of in a justice court if they could have found one for the, for the provo marshal. And it was a great experience. And then you came back to Riverside and rejoined the firm? That's right. And, and then continued. in 1949, I was appointed to the bench. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, during your time in the district attorney's office, and just briefly, I thought this was interesting in the reading that I did, uh, you participated in a death penalty case. I believe the defendant's name was McNeil. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, he was sentenced to death. And how was that carried out? Well, he was one of the last men hung in California. The, uh, what had he done? He killed, uh, murdered his wife, Melvie McNeil. I'll never forget that. He beat her to death with a, with a um, washing machine ringer roller. He was a powerful, powerful man, and uh, he was a blacksmith. He was also a, a deputy constable for Murrieta Justice Court. He oh was, but among other things, he he had a job uh, as a, the bouncer at the dance hall in Temecula, where they had the Indian dances every Saturday night, and they usually involved a, a considerable amount of drinking and dancing and fighting. And he was uh, uh, noted for being able to bang men's heads together and drag them out of the dance hall. And so, sometimes he was more, more enthusiastic than he should have been, and there was a lot of, of un unhappiness about that. And two Indian young men came to the district attorney's office, and I interviewed them, and they had been badly used by McNeil and wanted to see if uh, something couldn't be done. Well, I talked to the Indian agent and uh, trying to uh, avoid uh, uh, real contretemps here. Uh, and uh, uh, we got McNeil to uh, resign as the bouncer and agree not to do anything er ever anymore to uh, put his hands on any of the members of the, of the Indian group. And uh, that satisfied the, these Indian boys and the, and the leaders. And we thought that we had done something worthwhile, although I felt that he had been very high-handed with him. But uh, the, uh, we probably should have now, in retrospect, been more forceful toward McNeil. And uh, about a week or two after that was when he killed his wife. Now, you mentioned to me, when I was very interested in this, you had taken up an interest in photography, and so you were called out to the scene. The district attorney at the time yeah. wanted the deputies to go to the murder yeah, scenes. The, uh, Mr. Redwine, the uh, district attorney, wanted to have somebody from his office every time that there was a call of a murder to be there. He went himself if he was available or any other deputy. Well, when they got the news that there had been, that uh, Mrs. McNeil had been uh, uh, beaten up by her husband and killed. And uh, the, we had two uh, uh, investigators in the office, and one of them was a good friend of mine. And so he wanted to get some one of the deputies to go out, and, and I was free. And so we, we went out, and we went out there shortly after the sheriffs arrived, and uh, went in the house and so forth. And I was busy taking. Uh, I, I had a little. Uh, 35 millimeter camera, a little French camera. And uh, so I was shooting available light uh, stuff as far as I could and all around everywhere. And uh, I had got a picture of the, of the sink and uh, the butcher knife was on the ground. And McNeil then at the trial, for the, he didn't talk before the trial, at the trial he testified that he had come home at noon for lunch and uh, he and his, and when he came to the back door, he, his wife uh, berated him for some reason and uh, made him mad. And they had an argument. And she was slicing bread to make sandwiches. With this butcher knife. With a butcher knife. And that she came at him with the butcher knife. And he just reached back here and there. It just happened by sheer chance there was a, this washing machine ringer <laughs> was lying there. And he picked that up and uh, just beat the dickens out of her. Okay. 
at the trial, we found out what this defense was. We didn't know this at all. We didn't know about the, the, uh, the claim about the slicing the bread. He, he, he just kept quiet. I had these pictures which I developed in my little dark room at home. And I, I said, Earl, and I picked this one up. And, uh, and the, on the counter in the kitchen was a loaf of bread. And one end of it was open and some slices were out. And on the side of the bread package, it said sliced. <laughs> kind of blew his defense yes. out of the water. <laughs> And that, that I, and I was just, uh, you know, the uh, second. I, I, I had uh, the only thing that uh, Earl was. I was the youngest guy in the office, and he was uh, uh, very kind to let guys to help bring people along. He let me do a lot of inconsequential stuff like getting in the maps and the locations yeah. and uh -huh. and all that sort of stuff. And uh, so he let me identify the uh, picture. And uh, so I always, I always felt in some way I was responsible for her death for not throwing him in the jail <laughs> for beating the Indian boys up. Well, and I was, uh, I felt that justice was done. We later found he'd served a term for murder in the state of Washington, which we didn't know till later. Be before he became the constable in Yeah, Marietta. yeah, and well. uh, uh, and he all, and, and he'd also served a term, uh, a federal a term. Uh, for uh, uh, forgery, so I think they got the right man. Yeah. And, and you, and you very, had your very, Kodak uh, moment, didn't and you? And <laughs> very, very sadly, yes. uh, he had uh, three wonderful children, oh, that is and tragic. they testified in the case. And I really got well acquainted with them. And uh, and very sadly, the the young boy, when the wor World War Two came along joined the submarine service, and he and another Riverside boy were on one of the major submarines that was uh, sunk off of uh, Japan. Oh, tragic, sad story. Yeah. During the years that you were practicing law, and then your, your 24 years divided between the Superior Court bench and the Appellate Court bench, what do you think has been, in your opinion, the most significant change in, in the practice of law as you've seen it occur over the years? Well, I, I can't pontificate because I've <laughs> been on the sidelines for 32 years, <laughs> believe it, you know. I've been retired for that long. All right. But I, I do keep in touch with friends and uh, uh, practicing lawyers that I know. My daughter has been the for many years was the supervising uh, court reporter for the county. She's now retired, but she works part-time now because they always seem to be needing an extra hand. And from everything I see, it's just the great increase in California in every respect, traffic, population. The courts are jammed. When I started to practice, there were two departments of the Superior Court. I made the third when it was created. And that was in 1949. Yeah, now they have 55, 58 judges and uh, 18 commissioners and need 20 more. And you yeah. folks here, you know, uh, you just every, every uh, unit of the judiciary is just jammed with work. And I think that's the greatest change. The change being yeah. That in those days, when we first started practicing, you had time to put your feet up on the table and talk to your clients. And uh, uh, you, you uh, of course, all young lawyers, I think, have extra time. But in those days, you had extra, extra time. And even the older attorneys, it was a, uh, the difference began to uh, occur along about the 50s when the time uh, became so valuable. And everything had to be done by the minute. You the had to billable keep a hours concept. Billable hours diary all the time. In yeah. the before that, you, you you didn't do that. And and while I don't mean we didn't have to work, uh, we were busy. And I certainly was busy when I was on the bench. So we, but yeah. not to the pressure, not with the pressure that I think exists today. Yeah, I, think I think that's, that's the greatest change. 
very insightful and, and, and very true. You had an opportunity, obviously, when you practice law to really know your clients and and be friends with your clients, yeah. get to know their families, right. and spend time with them. I think them. so, yeah. and especially in a smaller town, I think, yeah. you know. And Riverside then was a small town. You were appointed to the Superior Court in 1949 by then Governor Warren. Warren. Mm -hmm. And in 1970, you were elevated, I believe, to the Appellate Court by then Governor Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the process when Earl Warren appointed you to the Superior Court bench? Were you seeking a judicial appointment? I, I How did that I, happen? I had the slightest idea <laughs> of being. Uh, I, I thought that my my partner, when the when the when the third department was created, I thought that my partner might be a. Uh, he was a vice president of the state bar at the time, and. Uh, I thought that uh, uh, Gene Best would be an ideal candidate, and uh, I gave no thought to it at all. Then, one day, I, I, I was president of the Bar Association at the time. One day, I got a, a and we were we had office hours on Saturday till noon, <laughs> and just about eleven thirty, I got a telephone call. The secretary came in and said the governor wants to talk to you. I couldn't think why he wanted to talk to me. Uh, and so he said, uh, Gabbert. Uh, this was the governor himself. Yeah. He huh? said, uh, uh, your uh, uncle Harry uh, Gabbert, uh, or Harry Gabbert was your uncle? I said, yeah. He said, he was a good man, he said. Uh, he said, I knew him well in college. He said, uh, uh, if you're half as good a man as he is, I'd like to have you serve as the Superior Court judge down in Riverside. Mm -hmm. I said, well, Governor, this is a very sudden. Uh, uh, when, uh, when do you have to know about how, how this is? I, I want to discuss it with my dad and with my partners here, and uh, I, I don't want to make an immediate commitment there. He says, well, I'll tell you. This is Saturday. Don't you tell anybody except your dad and your partners. And I will call you on Monday. So I talked to my partners and uh, I, I felt like a dog about that. But I, I thought at the time that it was, some, it was what I would really like to do very much. Um, and my father thought that was good, but he said, listen, and that was good advice. He said, uh, if you become a judge, I don't want you ever to run for any other office. Now, if you feel that you would be willing to do that, then, then, then you can, with my blessing, you can be a judge. Well, I, I really respected and loved my dad. And, and he was a man of experience and so forth, and he was right. And uh, so I said, well, I think I would. And so I went and told my two, well, three partners then, of course, but the major ones were my old, two as oldest ones, Raymond Best and Jean Best, uh, father and son, and they were wonderful people. And uh, so when the governor called back, I uh, told him I would do it, and which I did. So uh, that was the way it happened. I later learned uh, the background because there was somebody who put in a word for me uh, that I didn't even know was, had done it and uh, later found out. Well, that's an amazing story. Yeah. Now, when you were appointed by Governor Reagan to the appellate court bench, was the process as, as easy for you? Well, <laughs> no, not, not that easy. Uh, th when I knew that there was going to be another opening over in the 4th District. And that court, at that time, we sit here, this division in Riverside now, but at that time the division sat in San Bernardino County. San Bernardino, County. Yes. yes. All right. Um, I thought that uh, there were going to be two, there were going to be two openings in that, in the 4th uh, District over there then. And I knew that Bob 
Gardner from Orange County was a shoe in for one of them. And so I thought just, I, and I'd served a couple of, of uh, you know, uh, pro, -temed. pro tems over there and enjoyed it. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll put my name in, and uh, which I did. And then uh, uh, the, uh, after a certain period of time went by and so on, um, I'd, I'd sent some letters of a recommendation and so on, as I guess what everybody does. And uh, one of the assemblymen came to me and said that uh, that the uh, governor would like to appoint me, but that I was too old. And uh, so uh, I uh, accepted that. Then about you were at that time what sixty in nineteen. Uh, yes, I, yeah. I, I was about I was about sixty. <laughs> Having just turned sixty-one, I don't yeah. think that's too old. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I was I think I think I was just about sixty-one too because I only served four years on the court. That's why I, I wonder why they're interviewing <laughs> me here. Anyway, so uh, uh, then there was another opening came along shortly after that, and the governor appointed me, Governor Reagan. And uh, so that was how I, I served on the court. And I served there uh, four years until uh, uh, 1974. And uh, at that time, my dear wife uh, wanted to do some family things and do some traveling and one thing or another. And I uh, thought that I would do that. And I had a chance to uh, go out to the university here. Uh, if I wanted to, so I thought, well, I'll, I can do that, and and then when we get done with what we want to do, I can go out there perhaps and and work as an adjunct professor in uh, poli sci, and and uh, but I didn't do that for ten years, I guess, yeah. or eight years, <laughs> but because uh, we did some traveling and other things, and uh, uh, that was uh, I often think now that I made a great mistake. I should have stayed on for that next up until 70 but after that you then take a cut off on yes. salary and one thing or another so I thought well there was no advantage then uh, I was also asked to uh, serve pro tem uh, in, uh, in uh, by assignment and uh, at that time uh, the Chief Justice uh, Justice Byrd uh, had uh, a very strong feeling that Judges from other other courts, spare, retired appellate court judges, should go to the municipal courts, and that was a good idea. That's all right. But I and so I said I would think about it, and they said, "Well, we'll sign you to uh, the municipal court in Corona." Well, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, "Well, all I'll do is is screw up down there." I uh, all they have is. 50, 60 traffic cases a day. Yeah, I was going to say it's traffic. I <laughs> and uh, I said, I, I think, it's not that I, I felt that I was better than serving in those, that court, but I just felt that, that from my experience, it was a long time away from any traffic. I had been police judge here, city judge, before I went on the uh, court when I was in private practice. Yeah. And I knew a little bit about traffic, but that was years ago. And uh, so I... Uh, I thought, well, I just, I won't, I won't serve, and uh, and uh, did other things, and later taught for two or three years out at UCR, as you did. And enjoyed and that, that, I'm sure. I wish I'd done it for yeah. years. It was the most enjoyable thing I ever did. It is, it is interesting. In the <coughs> you sat with, as you already mentioned, Justice Gardner, who was the presiding judge mm -hmm. of that division. When I was there. And also Marcus Kaufman, who later became an associate well, justice of the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular memories or impressions of, of, of each of them. I know Justice Gardner is so colorful and Very has colorful. such a reputation yeah. for his, his uh, opinions, he, your impressions. He, uh, well, uh, Justice Gardner, uh, he, he, uh, he, he, he marched to his own drummer. He, he didn't come to the court with great frequency. In other words, maybe, uh, you know, a day or two a week he would come to the court. He did uh, most all of his work at home or on the beach or at the Santa Ana Law Library. And uh, 
He, he, he was a surfer, wasn't he? Yeah, he, when he wasn't surfing, he was writing opinions. <laughs> and, he, and he took all the, the uh, uh, criminal stuff. He had done lots of criminal work. He ha could handle it uh, practically out of his head without a great deal of, of uh, long, uh, tough research. But he was able to do yeah. everything. And he was capable, very capable guy. And he did and a he, lot of he, it, and too. And he could write he? fast, and he wrote short. And he, he could uh, he could grind out the opinion, so th that was great because uh, all the rest of the stuff uh, maybe we were spending too much time writing too long opinions, but uh, uh, there was a big uh, uh, effort being made at that time by the reporter of decisions to get uh, judges to cut down on the paper <laughs> and uh, write shorter opinions, and Judge Gardner was was able to do it and doing a wonderful work, and he was. Uh, but he was, uh, uh, you never, I, at least, he, uh, he, he kept to himself and uh, was very, uh, and presided perfectly uh, in the conferences and on the bench, but there was not a lot of, of uh, uh, give and take or collegiality with him because he was away so yeah. much of the time. Now, uh, Justice Kaufman, he, he was a, a workhorse and, uh, and a brilliant guy and a, a, a very, very able guy, but he was just s such a workhorse that uh, uh, I think that uh, he, he, they worked him to death <laughs> almost over there. Uh, Justice Kerrigan was a very uh, interesting guy and a very good lawyer and judge. And the, the amazing thing about Justice Kerrigan was if you walked into his office, he sat there and there was one sheet of paper in front of him. As soon as he finished doing something with one sheet of paper, he put it here and locked it in the desk and pulled another one out. My and goodness. there was never anything more than one sheet of paper that he was working on and that's what he was working on. And he, he was a, a interesting fellow. Unfortunately, he died while I was on the court, and I had I, known him because he was a Superior Court judge in San Bernardino for many years when I was here in Riverside County, so I know him well, and he was a very nice guy. Then the most interesting fellow at the time, I think, was uh, Captain Tamoran, and uh, yeah, he, you refer to him as Captain. Yeah, he was, we, we always called what him Captain. Like, why, why yeah, was Stephen that? Tamora. Yeah. Uh, Japanese uh, uh, and uh, a, a very able guy and a wonderful personality and a great uh, fellow to talk to. Both, uh, all of them, all four of us worked together. There's no problem. The only difficulty was that. Uh, uh, we were the four there, and, and then Gardner would come in, and uh, uh, then the, and we'd work with him. There was no, but uh, I think that there was a little uh, animosity, uh, or maybe not animosity, but a little uh, edginess between uh, Gardner and Kaufman. Uh, now, when Gardner would come in, often tomorrow, who lived in Santa Ana, would ride with him, or, or they'd change, uh, give each other a ride. So, uh, uh, and they were good friends because they'd served together on the spare court in, in uh, Orange, Orange County. County. And, uh, at, but there was some little uh, tension between uh, uh, Gardner and uh, Kerrigan. And, and Kerrigan or Kaufman? Well, Kaufman and, and Kerrigan, Kerrigan, both. All right. And uh, so there was a little tension there, but but generally, I, and I, I I I don't mean to emphasize that at all. Really, the atmosphere generally was very collegial, more collegial than I experienced sometimes on our own spirit court. Yeah. And uh, so I, it was fun. And but I found that I missed the give and take of being in the public square of the trial court, and I loved that more and missed that more, I think, than anything else. Uh, the, the, your contact, whereas uh, with, with the bar and the people and, and uh, life, 
whereas uh, you were constricted by the written word that you had to keep looking at all the time in the Court of Appeal. Yeah, there may have been a sense uh, of isolation more. I felt that, yeah. yes. Uh, yeah. Not uh, not so much that I was uh, turned off, but uh, it, I, I felt that I, I was happier where there were more people around. Yeah. You use the term collegiality just a number of times. We use it fairly frequently, particularly on the Court of Appeal. Do you, do you believe that, as you recall the Court of Appeal, this sense of collegiality helped shape the, the decisional law to some extent? Oh, I think so, because uh, I, there was, a, at least I felt on the Court of Appeal, uh, the, the feeling was that unless you had a pretty darn positive view of your righteous <laughs> position, that you were willing to concede that perhaps the other guys might be right, and under the circumstances, you, if, if they were the uh, a, a majority, that you would generally go along. We, I think we tried to uh, see if we couldn't com combine our viewpoints and, and come out uh, with fewer uh, uh, dissents. And, uh, uh, and I don't think that in any cases where there was a strong feeling anyone hesitated to write a dissent, but uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the dissents were few and far between. And it wasn't just a, a deal, it was because we were trying to see if we couldn't come to an agreement within reason and, uh, and maybe shape it a little bit differently and all get together. Mm -hmm recognizing that it was guidance for the the trial courts yeah. and and that you were in essence shaping the law right. To, right. to some extent that answers the next question that I had which what was it important to you to have unanimous opinions and, and in a sense it was well uh, I, I think that uh, the uh, PJ wanted us as far as we could to to show a unanimous point when we could do so without violent, violence to our uh, conscientious uh, view of the law. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, but I, I think that uh, there was an e effort being made at that time to try and cut down on, on uh, anything or just a, 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 a dissent for some personal viewpoint. <laughs> or uh, ideology or something of yeah. that sort that sometimes crept, crept yeah. in. What would you say was the judicial philosophy or that you had developed by the time you got to the appellate court? And do you think, or uh, so often I think our, our sense of that is shaped so much by uh, the times, social factors, yeah. historical factors, uh, and you went through the Great Depression. You went through uh, both world wars when you were nine or ten during the first world yeah. war. And I know in some of the reading I've done on you, you talk about how that really had a tremendous impact on you, maybe even more so than did the second world yeah. war. So do you think all of these things, or how do you think these things may have affected your sense of, of a well, I, you I, I think judge? that I think that at that time, uh, and and then it was impressed by the New Deal program that was carried on, and then World War II, that uh, there was a, a upspringing of of uh, a liberal viewpoints about uh, civil rights and things of this sort, and that I think was the the. Uh, uh, pretty much the way uh, I felt about uh, my personal uh, philosophy about uh, the law and, uh, and uh, the political governance of the, of the world, you know, at that time. Well, your father, I, I get the impression, having been a newspaper man, uh, his standing up for the, the uh, minority community yeah. here, that that also shaped your viewpoints well, on I many did, of these yeah. issues. Well, I did, My father was uh, uh, interesting. He was uh, very strong on uh, individual and civil rights, 
and absolutely devoid of any racial hatreds, prejudices, or otherwise. But he was a very conservative guy on the economic side of life. <laughs> His right. father, my grandfather, uh, was a, uh, a, a big-time farmer up in Ventura County, very active in the Republican Party. But he was a Hiram Johnson progressive. My father was a Republican conservative, they, and they had it out and out. And my my uh, grandfather uh, served in the legislature, and he was head of the Board of Supervisors for 30 years off and on in Ventura County. And he was a liberal, and my fa uh, a liberal Republican, a Hiram Johnson progressive, and my dad was very conservative. But they both agreed on civil rights. It's interesting that they, they, there was that peculiar deviation. And of course, I, I took my grandfather's position, and uh, which was kind of interesting. And my dad and I didn't agree at all on, uh, uh, on some aspects of politics, but uh, we, we agreed on so many other things it didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> he was a good father. When you served on the Court of Appeal, now we have permanent legal staff here. Mm -hmm. and. I don't recall in the 1970s, did you have what were called, as the U.S. Supreme Court has, you know, the elbow clerks, they serve one or two years, or did you have permanent staff? Well, uh, staff? I think the last year or maybe the last two years I was there, we had a, a chief researcher. Alex Yakutis was uh, the, uh, the uh, he, he was a, a head, head of all the research, and then each of us had a, uh, a, uh, a research assistant, <coughs> clerk, <coughs> and uh, so uh, I guess then the professional uh, principal staff is of what, 10 years? Oh yeah, uh, there's very seldom, not a lot of turnover. So at that time you had you had you were sort of easing into that sense of having a permanent staff or yeah. starting to do that. And uh, for uh, two of those years, uh, Bob had me uh, interview all the prospective uh, uh, clerks. Yeah. And I went up to uh, Stanford and uh, Berkeley and uh, USC and around and and I got lists and talked to fellas and had a list and submitted several names and then those they thought they wanted to get that, that I approved they brought them down and and nearly all of them were were uh, selected um, I can't I don't think any of them ever objected to my doing that and I, I just uh, and I enjoyed doing it so essentially the people you interviewed became uh, were hired and then became well, worked for the other justices or with the other cases. Yeah. Now, uh, whether that was true in every case, I yeah, can't but remember. But in this now, division, at least seems, at that time. But I, I, I brought down three or four anyway. What qualities, what were some of the qualities you looked for in those attorneys? Well, I, I wanted fellows that I thought uh, would uh, be uh, open, could talk to everybody, and uh, yet I wanted to ha have. Uh, have them uh, be forceful enough to be able to speak up, and uh, of course are interested in their GPAs and so on, and uh, oh, just kind of, I suppose, the, just the way that they appeal to you as to whether you thought they'd fit in, and I think most of them did. As a matter of fact, I still uh, maintain contacts with some of them. Oh, that's terrific. Mm -hmm. Can we take a little break here? Yeah. All right. There. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, Justice Gabbard, uh, you served 20 years on the trial bench. Did your perspective of your trial bench colleagues change at all after you became an appellate court justice? You mean my view of, of what happened on the trial yeah. court? Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure it did because I, I think that uh, uh, I, I wondered if we had uh, uh, kept in, uh, in the back of our minds the, enough, perhaps the, uh, when we were on the trial bench, the, uh, uh, 
uh, oversight of the higher courts. I, I think we ha you have the tendency on trial court to forget sometimes <laughs> and just go ahead. Well, you're in the trenches. Yeah. <laughs> And, and yeah. making immediate yeah. decisions, yeah. What, what do, to you are the qualities of a good appellate court justice? Well, I, I think, it, first of all, you must not be ideologically uh, stiff. <laughs> you must be uh, open-minded. And I think that uh, you, you should, uh, to the very best of your ability, uh, put out of your mind any... Uh, uh, preconceived ideas, uh, but it's impossible to do it, of course, really, to when you get down to an absolute bedrock, but you've got to do your best to be as close to the neutral as you can as you review things, and not to be, uh, uh, because it's a, a certain category of case, prejudiced against one view of, or one area mm -hmm. of that prejudice uh, in the in the case or not and uh, I think that's very very important and uh, I think that uh, uh, one of the most important things is also to uh, uh, be uh, to tr try and uh, uh, make up your mind after you review everything but do it within the limits and not let things back up on you and uh, to, to, de to decide the matter and, and then go ahead on other things. You have to do it and sometimes awfully difficult as you know. Well, And I, that's true in the trial courts I, too. I was just going to say, yeah. I recall on the trial bench and, yeah. and maybe even more so, you have less time to ruminate yeah. about things and, and you have yeah. to make instantaneous And I think that you, you've got to develop a, 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 a patient, a, a, a willingness to be patient with people. And things, and and uh, not uh, let things get to your plumbing, and not uh, <laughs> not become uh, exasperated. Uh, sometimes you have to be, perhaps a little bit. But I think that whenever you do make errors, you're more likely to make them when you're when you get your temper up a little bit. And uh, old Judge Dahe, who was many, many, many years the, the judge up at Inyo County. He served down here by assignment for about seven years, and uh, both when I was uh, practicing and when I was on the bench. And I, I just thought he was a, a wonderful judge because of his attitude, his temperament. And when the governor announced my appointment, my father uh, was unable to drive, and he had to go up to uh, near Sacramento on business. And so this was just the weekend before I was going to be sworn in or the week before and uh, so he asked me if I'd drive him up and so which I did and uh, we had a very pleasant several days together and uh, and then on the way back he wanted to go by and do something in San Francisco we stayed overnight in the one of the downtown hotels and in the morning we went down for breakfast and in the dining room there was Judge Day he's sitting by himself at a table and I know I had known him very well, and so I went over. And I said, "Would would you like to, uh, or may we sit down with you, Judge?" And he said, "Sure." And so I introduced my father, and he had heard that I had been appointed, and so he said, "You know," he said, "I'm an old old man." He said, "I want to make a suggestion to you, John." <laughs> he said, uh, "John, remember this: every lawyer has a right to lose his own case." Just be patient. <laughs> be patient. Do you know he died two days after that? Then I was sworn in. They didn't have a courtroom for me. The judicial council knew this, and so they assigned me to take care of the Inyo cases. Now, they, they didn't need anybody up there full time, but every time they needed somebody for three or four days, they would right ahead or phone ahead and ask me if I could come up and I went. So actually I served about half my time in Inyo County before they got another judge. Oh my this other judge was a young man. He went on, was sworn in, served a short time and died. So then I got 
signed again to Inukai. It was 27 months before I had a courtroom in Riverside. I never knew that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I in learned independence? Uh, uh, in independence. I, well, I loved it. Yeah. And when I first went up there, and this is a story I've just got to tell you. Um, there was a, one little dining room, uh, eatery, greasy spoon or whatever it was in, in independence. And uh, everybody gathered there uh, for meals. And uh, everybody went over there during the, any breaks and, uh, and so forth for coffee. And of course, I was like the fly on the wall. I didn't know anybody, and I would just go over there and sit by myself and have breakfast or lunch or have a cup of coffee or something. And there was only one topic of conversation for about a week. And that is, why was it that so-and-so wasn't elected as supervisor? Everybody loved him. He's the best guy that ever was. Everybody thought he was this wonderful. Why did he get de defeated? And then after about a week, they finally came up with a consensus. This is absolutely the fact. They agreed that he wasn't elected because he didn't wear a big hat. <laughs> and that was Inyo County and Independence, and I just loved it. <laughs> <laughs> they were wonderful people up there. Oh. And Judge Day, he incidentally, was a, born up there in the 1870s. Oh my and uh, his, he had come with his family by, as I understand it, by covered wagon. And they, they homesteaded in, in, uh, up in that area. Up in that valley. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, interesting. He, was, he went to Hastings Law School, and he was a good judge. Just because he had the, uh, that wonderful temperament. I tried cases before, before I went on the court. And I thought he was just a wonderful judge then. And uh, I always thought that. And I thought that he gave me some good advice. <laughs> you know, you must be prescient. My very next inquiry was going to be in question. Do you remember the best advice you received as a justice or a judge? Well, so I think that, I think that, was, that, that. was that yeah. was pretty high on the list. Boy. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Another, another thing, too, was, uh, and this was before I was, uh, was a judge, when, as I told you, we uh, talked to uh, Justice, uh, 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 <laughs> in Los Angeles, uh, when I had him take over the water case. Preston. Preston. And uh, he told me in the few days off and on where there, he'd tell me stories. And, and w once he said that, he told me that he had re was under, I had asked him how he enjoyed the work in the court or something. And, and he said, well, he said, you know, I, I was criticized a lot while I was on the court by my brethren because mm -hmm. he said uh, I would get my assignments and I would ha have them done and then maybe I'd finish them up and uh, then uh, I'd Maybe for the, in the last week or so of the, of the uh, uh, month, I, I would have all my work done. And he said, I'd go out and play some golf. And he said, I received a lot of, a lot of unfavorable comment from my brother that I was out playing golf. And they were worried. He said, you know, he said, you've got to make up your mind. And he said, I fortunately or unfortunately, whatever it was, had the ability to make up my mind fast. And he said, I did that, and I was criticized for it. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, at least it, it appeared to me that it was a virtue to be able to make up your mind, whether it was fast or slow. Yeah. You had to do it. To be decisive. Yeah. And, 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 I, and, the yeah. Only, and then the worst, I think the worst thing on the trial court was when I, you had a, a situation you, you uh, had to determine yourself. And... And it was just so tough to make up your mind as to, uh, whenever I got into any trouble like that, I thought about Justice Preston and just said, well, it's got to be done and do it one way or another. And, and that's what you have to do. Yeah. Good advice. So it turned out to be. Yeah. Have you seen a shift in attitudes of the public toward <laughs> the legal profession over the years? Well, you know, I've been doing some reading, and uh, uh, here in the last uh, couple of weeks, I've read two books about uh, Justice Field, Stephen J. Field, who was uh, who came here in 1849, was a lawyer and and uh, an Alcalde judge, and then 
uh, then a, a district judge and member of the Supreme Court and Chief Justice and then went to the U.S. Supreme Court and was served 30 some years on that court, I guess maybe the second longest term. Great judge and a very interesting character. It seems to me that the vituperation, <laughs> if that's the word, yeah. against the court uh, by almost everybody was against everything they did, it seems, over the years. And uh, I, I think maybe the the actually the the arguments against the courts today are much calmer than they were then. You read read the uh, uh, the editorials in the San Francisco papers about uh, any actions of the Supreme Court that they thought were, didn't like. They were terribly. Uh, vituperative against the members of the court. This was back in the and this late was 1800s, yeah, not yeah, the yeah, 1900s, and it, yeah. it continued. And he, for example, uh, uh, the he or the court were criticized almost any way they went on the la decision on the land title cases, mm -hmm. on the Chinese exclusionary and and uh, uh, cases and the cases with respect to discriminatory fining of uh, of uh, the. Mexican miners or the Chinese or anything or the Chinese Chinese laundries that went to the Supreme Court and all that sort of thing. They just were terribly uh, uh, critical. They were accused of being, uh, you know, of being uh, subject to accepting bribes and all sorts of things. Uh, out, just out and out outrageous claims. Maybe they weren't so outrageous, I don't know, but they were certainly outrageous as far as we're concerned today. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that they, we were any worse today. I think it's just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> these aren't simple songs we sing. They're, they're, uh, they're, they went on then and they're going on now, but I don't think they're as bad. Yeah, I, I sometimes perhaps maybe in light of the technological advances, we just hear, hear it more frequently and, yeah. uh, and well, sooner. I, I thought, uh, I, I really believe that I've had kind of a change of viewpoint here just recently. By I've been doing a lot of historical reading in California history and uh, just uh, legal history and it's, it's just uh, amazing uh, how uh, the courts were uh, vilified. Almost every issue. Maybe they took their, their politics more seriously, and the courts were more political. Yes, you were ran on a Democrat or a Republican or a know nothing or uh, some other uh, union ticket or something, and um, and they were they were more political, I'm sure, and uh, subject to uh, all the arguments. But uh, the, the arguments against the Supreme Court and. Bush versus Gore are nothing compared with what they were in the Supreme Court case of when they, the commission uh, was a, a report on the Hayes Tilden mm -hmm. uh, uh, the presidential election, yeah. uh, uh, electoral vote, and so I, I don't I don't think that they're not new. These aren't new, and they're probably no worse, no better than they were before. And we hear so much, and, and I think rightfully so, that the judiciary is a third independent branch of the government, and uh, independent branch, and we have to maintain the independence of the judiciary. So it seems to me this has been a common theme, and now you is a have, common theme. Yeah, now. this is something, something that's something not new, new that's never yeah. been heard before. It's, as it was in the beginning, it's, so today official sinning is and shall be reign forevermore, as I, as Kipling used to say. Justice Gabbard, during your legal and judicial careers, this country has experienced enormous social and economic upheavals. We've had wars, depressions, changing cultural mores, uh, huge quantum leaps in technology. Uh, we have a huge population with enormous diversity. From the vantage point of someone older and wiser, <laughs> what advice would you give to a new lawyer? Well, I, I would say in the first place, if you go to practice law, practice it with civility. You've got to work hard. You've got to spend time and effort. 
you shouldn't try to get rich overnight and uh, you should uh, practice in, in some area, uh, location, and uh, where, where you want to live and, and remain <laughs> and, and grow with the country. But I think the, the, the biggest thing I think that I, I would urge is practice law with civility. And I tell you, uh, I don't know because I'm not around the courts now to, to do it. But in the old days, it seems to me that there were uh, upper crust of lawyers who maintained that civil approach toward everybody, and it paid off. And I think that's one of the big things that that a young lawyer should learn is is to be civil. Without me, I don't mean to be uh, not compromising your clients. Don't compromise anyway. your yeah. clients, but you can do this in, in a civil manner. You can say very well instead of shouting about it. How about uh, a newly appointed judge? Advice? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I'm so far removed. It's hard to say. I, I would say the same thing. Just, just in the first place, put aside any thoughts of other uh, political activity. If, if it ever comes to that, that can be done. But you shouldn't be thinking about a political life if you want to be a good judge, in my opinion. Now, I know that uh, that is not the case always and, and probably shouldn't be. But it seems to me that you've got to set aside your political ambitions if you want to be a good judge. You've got to just say, this is what I want to do, and this is a, a worthy calling. I can do a lot uh, for society and, and doing a good job here. And, and if you don't want to commit yourself to that, well, then go out and run for dog catcher or whatever. What challenges do you believe the courts face in the future? And as you think about that question, do you think that these challenges may be any more difficult than the challenges that were faced in the, in the judicial system in the past. And you've touched a little bit on that, I think. Well, I think that they've, they, they've, they went through all these same things. When, when you think of the divisions caused by slavery, yes. that, that, that overshadowed everything for 50 years in California for example. Mm -hmm. Southern California was largely uh, flooded with Southern sympathizers. Northern California were nearly all from, now this is exact, but yeah, they, the majority speaking, of yeah. the Anglos that came into Los Angeles Pueblo were Southerners. And so when they went to the convention, they wanted California to come in as a slave state. The northern uh, people wanted California to come in as a free state. And so they, that's the Constitutional Convention in Monterey. The northerners prevailed by nine votes. Nine votes. And the, uh, at that time, the north and south were evenly divided in a number of states. So Congress dithered and didn't do anything. They didn't even set up a, a territorial government for California. California was in chaos for over a year and a half. The only thing that kept it uh, from going, disintegrating entirely was the fact that General Riley was out here with a regiment of men up in uh, San Francisco. And, uh, and they had a detailed out, out down here and the Mormon battalion marched to, to San Diego. If they hadn't had the military here, the whole system would have disintegrated. General Riley, just on his own, called for a constitutional convention, and the, which he held, and uh, and they set up uh, the basic, uh, did a good job on the basic constitution of California to come in as a free state. That forced the Missouri, I mean the uh, Compromise of 1850, whereby California was allowed to come in as a free state, and uh, the territories of Utah and New Mexico could come in and then later determine by popular sovereignty or some other thing yeah. they didn't say 
whether they would come in as slave states, but they were intended to do that. Then the southern groups that lived in Southern California wanted to set up a slave state in Southern California. They thought that if they came in as a slave state here, the North could come in as a free state and they'd both come into states. And that was defeated, of course. But the, the, the turmoil all over the country in that, uh, we can't even imagine. I mean, we're not near the Civil War mentality, thank God. But I do say that we have serious, seriously uh, partisan, divided national government at the moment. I hope sanity may prevail somewhere along the line, but it's nowhere near what it was in those days when every every guy was carrying a pistol and a bowie knife pretty much for his neighbor. Yeah, perhaps we've lost our historical perspective. Yeah, and I think you got to have view it, it yeah. through that prism. I'm going to stop and change this. Yeah. Justice Gabbert, what did you enjoy most about your judicial career? You know, the thing I really enjoyed doing the most was handling juvenile cases. That's very <clears throat> I, I always felt that there was some place I might do a little bit of good. Mm -hmm. Not often, but once in a while, and I did, I think, a few times, have some, uh, had, did some good there. And uh, I just felt, feel that uh, there's a place where uh, a judge can make a difference. Not every case by any manner or means, but in several of them. And, and, and for that reason, I, I've uh, set up a, a um, juvenile uh, uh, justice foundation through the Riverside Community Foundation to give some extra funds to the juvenile judges when they need funds for special aid that they can give. They can't get money for, out for out of, through normal channels and maybe something that could really be helpful. And uh, the, it's just beginning to come to the point where they're getting a little enough money to do something with it. And uh, I think that there's a place where uh, uh, a judge can make a difference. Now, you can make a difference too in the domestic relations court yeah. where you have so many dysfunctional situations that you're overwhelmed uh, and of course you can do a, a, the best thing you can do is do, do a good job in deciding cases for the, in the very best way you possibly can and uh, but I think the place where you have the greatest uh, perhaps uh, opportunity and maybe freedom uh, to do something uh, that isn't so always so hidebound is in juvenile. Yeah I would agree with you I think that's very true. What qualities do you think you've possessed that have made you, and there is a consensus, you were a very successful judge. <laughs> no. So given that as the premise, what, what qualities do you think you have? Well, that, thank you for saying that, but uh, I think that so uh, if I tried to, to override my temper. <laughs> I, and I, I think that uh, that's, uh, in other words, try to not let, let it get under your hide and, and uh, I used it to, uh, really in my own mind Judge Day because I thought that he like did that. such a, a wonderful job in that way regard. When things were nasty, he just was as easy as ever. And if you could only, I couldn't do it all the time, but I think I tried hard to, to be patient as he suggested. And, and I think incidentally, the spelling of Day, he is D-E-H-Y. <laughs> What impact did your career, your judicial career, have on your personal life and your family and how you related to your community? Well, I enjoyed it very much, and I, I think that, uh, that uh, the only thing that was when my kids were little, uh, I was so darn busy trying to <laughs> do the job that I didn't give them as much time as I wish I had mm -hmm. now. but. They all turn out okay, and, and we're all friends, and <laughs> thank God they're taking care of me now. <laughs> and, and do you believe that in terms of, of your relationship to the community, that it provided you an additional forum to get things done, maybe, or yeah. to help uh, get things accomplished? I know you were very active in I was seeing active the in UCR campus I was, came I here. I was uh, president of the uh, 
uh, uniform United School District and uh, and served on that and I I was active in a number of organizations you know of uh, uh, YMCA and uh, uh, and things of that sort and then spent a great deal of time uh, working for the development and and the uh, uh, placement of the university here and I've been I've worked on that always ever since and uh, served on the uh, on the, as a trustee and so forth and uh, I've felt that that was a place where we really made a difference and and for those uh, who may be listening to this uh, when you talk about the campus you're talking about the University of California Riverside campus right. you were very much responsible, uh, you and and people that you influenced, and uh, in getting that here, located yeah, we, here. We were really lobbying for yes. it from the very beginning, uh, from the uh, t day one, and uh, a great bunch of people who worked, uh, you know, with no selfish motives at all, and and worked uh, hard to see the dream come true, and it, it exceeded our expectations because we. We thought we were going to get a small, very high-grade uh, liberal arts college, and that was about the best we could get as a branch of the university here—a special liberal arts, small, high-grade college, you know, uh, the Swarthmore of the West, or something <laughs> of that sort. And what we got is is so much better because the uh, Washington Monthly uh, uh, survey puts. UC Riverside, number 22 out of uh, a list of over 400 four-year national universities. We're in 22nd place. We're ahead of a number of famous yes. institutions, and this, we're only 50 years old. And the enrollment now, do you have any idea what it is? It's about 18,000, and, and uh, they expect 25 shortly. That's a real success story. Mm -hmm. And I know in 1978, 1998, uh, the 97-98, the Riverside Chamber of Commerce named you Citizen of the Year, and that was largely, I think, in response to your being so influential in all of the work that you did in getting the campus here. Well, I think so. I didn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> Any regrets about your judicial career? Anything you would have done differently? Well, yeah, I think, as I said before, my only regret is I, I should have stayed on for another five years till I was 70. And uh, I think that, that uh, I wish I had done that. But at the time, it seemed to, to be the best thing for my family, uh, my wife particularly. She, she really wanted to th do some things, and uh, I wanted to do them too. And so uh, I let that make the decision. And, and I, I, I think I, was, uh, I made a mistake there. I, I could have done them and still stayed on. How would you like to be remembered in terms of your professional legal career and particularly your judicial career? Well, <laughs> what was the guy on his tombstone? He said he wanted, he'd done his damnedest. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> Anyhow, that's, that I would just, that I'd try, I tried <laughs> to, right. to be a good citizen. And uh, I, uh, I think that uh, I've achieved to a small degree, but I, there are a lot of things I left undone. <laughs> yeah. We appreciate, Justice Gabbard, you're allowing us to memorialize some of the highlights of this remarkable 40-year legal career and the life that has spanned the most important social, cultural, scientific, and historic events of this century, the 20th century, and starting into the 21st century. You have been described, and I know this will bother you, but I have to say this, as a jewel in our legal community. And I think in our conversation this afternoon that this has become self-evident. Thank well, you so much for the privilege of this Thank you for the opportunity, and thank our good operator here. Uh, I'm pleased yes. that I've had the opportunity. It's, it's uh, an old guy gets loquacious, and that's what I've been, I oh, guess. It's been a real <laughs> pleasure. Thank you. And just